No empiece. My cat's starting stuff. You know what? I keep on moving the microphone like this, so I mean, it's gonna sound crazy. Fair warning. Testing, testing. El diablo es un mentiroso, señor. Lo reprenda en el nombre de Jesús. Can y'all hear me? <laughs> What's up, y'all? It's Tally. Welcome back to Time with Tally, and actually, specifically, Talks with Tally. Today, I'm gonna bring you guys a word that the Lord has put upon my heart. Quite a while ago, when I began my journey with the Lord, um, when I reconciled my life with Christ a couple of months ago, this word was already put on my heart, so I'm ready to let it go. It's it's time. The Lord has been yelling at me already. <laughs> it's time. Use what I have given you. Go for it. Because at the end of the day, it's, it's Him. It's Him that's guiding me. So without further ado, let's get right into it. We're gonna pray first, and I'm gonna share what it is that the Lord has given me and placed in my heart. Glory to Him always. Father God, I want to come to you in this moment. Lord God, as your daughter, I want to say thank you so much, Lord, for the opportunity of actually being alive today, first and foremost, Lord. But also not only that, Lord, the fact that I get to sit here, Lord God, in front, in front of this camera with this microphone in my hand, with your word on my lap, Lord, knowing that you have placed a word, Lord, in my heart for quite a while now, Lord. I just want to say thank you so much for the opportunity, Lord, to be able to share this. I'm praying, Lord, that for your glory, Lord God, that the word that I share today be one that someone needs to hear on the other side of that camera, Lord. Let it be you, Father God, talking to the heart. Separate the word in as many ways that you need to separate it, Lord, so each person can get the word that they need for their lives, Lord. In Jesus' name, I pray. Amen. Amen. All right, y'all. So the title for this word the Lord has given me is Relationship Over Religion. It's a very difficult topic, especially for now in the world that we're living in, but I'm gonna let the Lord lead the way. We're gonna start with John 15, verses 15 through 16. It states, I no longer call you servants because a servant does not know his master's business. Instead, I have called you friends for everything that I learned from my father I have made known to you. 16, you did not choose me, but I chose you. And it continues, but that's the part I wanna focus on right now. I wanna tell you a quick story about a time that I went through last year that nobody really knew about. Probably one of the most difficult times of my life ever where I slipped into probably the worst depression of my life. Trigger warning, I wanted to take my life. It was that bad. Nobody really knew of me for um, quite a bit of time, I would say a few weeks I had really withdrawn myself, but there came a certain point where I literally just decided I wasn't answering anybody's calls, anybody's texts. I was just not responding. You could not find me. And then something happened one day where I had reached probably one of my wits ends. <laughs> it was about day four. Yes, I had gotten to the point that I hadn't eaten in about that amount of time. Was struggling so badly in certain areas. I had just finished school, finances were not the best. And long story short, my emotions were all over the place. Um, my mental took took a toll. One, because I didn't have more food in my fridge. But two, whew, which is hard to talk about because I used to be a pretty prideful person. I never spoke about this stuff with anybody, but it's real life. So some people really need to hear this. I had nothing else to offer of the world and I didn't want to be in the world anymore. And then out of nowhere, I got a knock at my door in the middle of the evening and it was my best friend. My best friend popped up on my doorstep because I hadn't been returning her, her calls or texts either. I opened the door and she starts to freak out at me. She's like, I know you, I know your text messages. You think I don't know you? Do you think I don't realize that there's something wrong and you're not telling me? And with the shame that I felt for, for keeping this from her, I just began to cry. I think about the story, it's so, it's like emotional. But I just start to cry and I'm like, yes, it's been so bad. It's been so, so bad. I'm, I'm so low right now. I've never been this low. Yeah, as I haven't been able to eat in four days because I had no food, but also because I was too prideful to ask anybody or tell anybody around me that I was struggling. But she knew. I didn't have to say anything. She knew me. She knew even the slightest changes of my behavior in my voice. And she catched it immediately. She allowed me some grace for a little bit there, but when the jig was up, it was done. She was having no more of it. And I'm so thankful that that's the case. I love you guys. <laughs> John 10 verses 27, 28, it says, my sheep listen to my voice. I know them and they follow me. I give them eternal life and they shall never perish. No one will snatch them out of my hand. If my best friend didn't know me, 
right? If she was a stranger, let's say, she would have never been able to identify what my cry for help was. Ooh, Lord, because my cry for help was not obvious. I've never been the type of person to cry a lot. I've never been very emotional. My family says I'm a pretty cold, dry person. But remember, to her, it was a scream. It was obvious that I needed help because she knows me. We have a relationship. It's not a relationship that's superficial. It's not a ritual. It's not ritualistic. We don't hang out just to hang out type of deal. We don't hang out to just not be alone. We adore each other and we love each other in every season. And I'm here to let you know that this closeness and far more is what he wants with us. I said us, that includes you. I'm here to remind you that you don't just call someone your friend just to call them your friend. After a certain amount of time, after cultivating that bond, you are able to say and to know what that person is thinking before they even actually think it or say it. You know their plans, you know what their desires are, you know their likes, you know their dislikes, you know their dreams, their goals, their aspirations. You know their triggers and you know exactly what they're gonna feel like when certain things occur. And what's so beautiful about God is the fact that he has given us this word right here. This promise. And I don't know about you guys, but I know that when me and my best friends, we make promises to each other. We keep those promises. This book is not a book that is a self-help book. It is a book with testimonies and written witness statements of who he is. This book is to get to know him his wants, his desires. Could you imagine if your best friend came with a manual on how to get to know them better and get closer to them? He gives us the answers in his word. How amazing, wow. That's like, it's literally like having a password, easy access point, right? The open door is right there for you to walk through and to become best friends with God. He, is, he literally gave it to you. He gave you his word, he gave you his promise. He gave you easy access to him. This book shows us his desires, his wants, his dislikes, what he appreciates, and also his plans. Woof, be careful. Because everybody knows what I'm talking about when it says plans. The prophecies in this book are his plans for your life and for this world. How powerful. Wow, Lord. Thank you, Lord. But that's why you can't be calling a stranger a friend until you know the depths like these of that person because they can be dangerous. Wow, Lord. I need to talk to you guys really quick about something that's very difficult to talk about, but it's very, very factual. And I know for a fact that the Lord has called me to be somebody that speaks truth with authority that he has gifted me for your glory, Lord. We need to talk about the truth of the religious mindset. There are very much religious Christians out there. And I need to tell you right now, religion and relationship are not the same thing. He wants relationship with us. Religion likes to teach us that there are gods out there that are unreachable, unattainable, that we have to do certain works or certain actions in order to be able to attain them or to attain some type of heaven. When my God, the God I serve, says the total opposite. He is the counterculture. Wow. Meanwhile, other religions preach having to do certain works just in order to be good or worthy enough for the attention of a God or to even be deemed as a good person. Mm. Meanwhile, his word says that none of us are good, actually. The only one that's good is him. Through him, we can do all things. So therefore, what I'm telling you is, is that through him in a relationship with him, all things are possible. It's not just going to church on Sundays. It's not just posting a cute verse on Facebook. It's not just posting a cute picture of you in a church outfit. And this is not judgment by any means. This is me as a sister in Christ coming to you and just saying, hey, there is so much more than you could even imagine in creating a relationship with him. There is so much more depth than you could even perceive right now. But many people are so used to the superficial type of relationships. That commitment, oh Lord, speak. That depth scares them. Some people are too scared to get into deep. Wow, Lord, thank you, Holy Spirit, wow. Because they've been hurt in the past. And can I tell you, what hurt me in my past was exactly that, religion. Religion is what hurt me. What caused church trauma, church hurt. It indirectly caused me to believe that actually it was God that was hurting me. That the God that they were teaching me about was the God that was real and that he did not like me, he did not love me, he was sending me to hell if I wasn't perfect. Lies. 
It's all lies. Now, it doesn't mean that you just openly sin just because you have his grace and forgiveness and you know he's forgiving. How messed up would it be if you were in a relationship with someone and they took advantage of how forgiving you are? Hello? <laughs> I don't know the girlies understand me when I say this. Have you ever been in a relationship where a man will mess up so many times and you just keep forgiving because you have a good heart, you see the potential, you have the hope, you have the faith, yet they continue to disappoint you? The difference between me and you and God is that his grace and his forgiveness never runs out. But it doesn't mean that you take advantage of it because that's not right. We owe him our life. So he deserves that respect. So amazing, wow. It's funny because I actually, I do a Bible study, right? Every week, I do weekly Bible studies on Zoom. If anybody would like the link, I am more than down to link it down below. Men and women are included, of course. Um, everybody's welcome. So I do change up the dates depending on when they schedule me for work, but long story short, if you want the link, just comment below and I will absolutely post the link so you guys can join me on Zoom for Bible studies. So it's funny because the way that I explain the Bible to some people, I feel as if, God forgive me if I'm mistaken, I'm being called to teach people about the word and preach the gospel of God and Jesus, but especially to people that don't know him, that probably have been hurt by religion and the rules and the man-made doctrines. The stuff that the Pharisees in the Bible, people that knew the law, the religious law, things like that, whatever, we can talk more about them later at a later time. Those people were the ones that Jesus was always butting heads with because they would always preach the law and preach God's law and what God said. But Jesus was always telling them, you may know the word, but you never live in it. And instead what they do is they just use the word to condemn people and to judge them, not love them and to cast them away from them as if they were holier than thou. And that's the problem. To be honest, Jesus is telling us, we're all sinners. You told a white lie, sinner. You hated somebody, sinner. You gossip about somebody, sinner. You looked at somebody lustfully a little bit too long, sinner. We all have done it one way or another, whether you're even aware of it or not. We have all sinned, every single one of us. I think the problem also too is the fact that a lot of us like to nowadays do this thing where we actually love to measure the degree of which a sin is in like level of like cruelty and you know, how bad is this sin? What is the degree of how bad this sin is? When in reality, in God's eyes, they're measured all the same. White lie, murder, the same. But yet what's amazing is the fact that even though we were born into this world of sin and born with this, what Cliff Connectally likes to say is readiness to sin factor within us because we're, we're in it. Y'all wanna talk about nature versus like nurture? We are born in an environment that's flooded with likelihood of sin. Yet Jesus says, even though the word says the debt of sin, any sin, is death. He said, I'm gonna get on that cross and I'm gonna pay for your debt with my own flesh, with my own body, and I'm gonna be the sacrifice and pay the debt of your sins, all of us. And he was the perfect sacrifice because he had never sinned not once. So he was more than enough to pay for all of us. Wow. Wow, wow, wow. And then I think about all the times that I doubted, all the times that I denied God's existence or what Jesus had done for me. To me, it just fathoms me how much he loves us, every single one of us, everyone. You die for me, right? You die, give your life, even though you were resurrected thir the third day. And yet all you want in return is that I follow you, that I follow your teachings, that I believe that you did that, that I believe that you love me. Bet, like it's not. It's actually not that hard to believe in something. The problem is though, is that sometimes we just don't wanna believe in something more because our human brains can't comprehend it sometimes. I'm gonna be honest with you, I can't even fathom that love sometimes because I don't think I'm capable fully to, to love people in that way. I love people so much, so, so much that I feel like the love that God has given me is definitely a gift. The love that I'm able to show other people, that's a gift. But I don't know if as a human, I could even love people as much as that. I could try my best, but nothing compares to his love. Relationship with God says that there is one God, the one true God, our God, that actually instead of being far away and unattainable, that we have to do works in order to get his attention and get his love and feel somewhat worthy for him or better in life or heaven, whatever it is that we're actually running after, he actually is outreaching his hand. He's reaching out to you, actually. You that are watching across the screen, he's reaching out to you. How much longer are you gonna keep running? Ooh. What he is showing us is that he's outreaching his hand and guess what? Loophole, <laughs> he says, actually, none of the works that you do are actually worth it. None of the works that you do will ever suffice for you to make it into heaven. We live in a world nowadays where it's like, work hard, 
so you can attain this result. God is the opposite. Now it doesn't mean that you don't have faith and then don't do work, of course. Of course you work in faith, that these things will come to pass because his word says so and his word is promised and it is certain. But what he's saying is, is that no matter what you do on this earth, no matter how much of a good person you call yourself, no matter how much you give to the homeless, no matter how much you're gracious and forgiving and nice to people, none of that matters. One, especially if you don't give it to him, but two, nothing that we do is ever going to be deserving of everlasting life. After everything that we've done, let's be honest, but that's why he sent his son Jesus to die on that cross for us. Come back up on the third day and say, hey, I'm here still and I will not leave you as orphans. And then he sends us the Holy Spirit, which is with us today. So when you get that gut feeling, that intuition that's telling you this isn't right, this is dangerous, this is not gonna go well. That's him convicting you and saying, turn around, go a different way. This is gonna hurt you and I don't want you to be hurt. Please listen to me. Because people love to think that God is like always trying to point at people, be mad at people and all these other things. When in reality, he's saying, let me pick you up and just make sure that you're safe. Make sure that you're okay, that you're protected because I don't want you to get hurt. Stick with me, you'll be all right. Stick with me by my side and I'm gonna make sure that you're okay. I'll keep you under my wing and I'll make sure that even though there will still be suffering, it will be worth it because you have an answer to, your, to the peace that you're looking for. You have an answer to the suffering that you're going through. There's actually a reason for it this time. Wow, wow God. It's really just up to us to reach back out to him. It's hard because sometimes as a person, let's be very, you know, real. Because I've always been very real on this channel and I'm not gonna stop being real. It's been really difficult to ever tell somebody I'm a Christian because of how people have gotten that sour taste in their mouth due to the actions of others that haven't acted in a Christ-like way, which is what he calls us to do, right? Just to give some context, what I believe in is I believe in the triune God. I believe in the fact that God is one entity that's made up of three parts. Think of it maybe, I don't know, like a three part uh, triangle. Let's think of a, tri a triangle, right? A triangle has three parts that create one thing. God is one thing, but the three branches of it are Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. If you were to remove one of those corners, there would no longer be God because they're all part of God. They all make up God. It is one God in three different parts with three different functions, three different roles. God is comprised of the Father. Ooh the big man above. Then we have Jesus, which is God and also human. 100% human, 100% God. The physical was Jesus. And then there's the Holy Spirit, which is God's spirit on earth. God said, I'm gonna put on some flesh and I'm gonna shake some things up on earth. I need to go down there myself. I gotta teach them the truth because there's way too much lying, there's way too much sinning, there's way too much killing, there's way too much lust, there's way too much evil down here. They need redirection. They need an answer to the pain. They need an answer to the hurt, to the abandonment, to the anxiety, to the depression. They need an answer to their suffering. Religion, unfortunately, teaches us condemning each other is okay, but also it teaches us. Notice how these two things are very, very different so far. Religion and relationship are two very different things so far. Religion teaches us that, <laughs> wow, God works from the outside in, right? You gotta change your clothes a certain type of way. You gotta make sure you don't wear no certain type of makeup. You gotta make sure that you don't wear no type of jewelry, no tattoos, whatever it may be, you gotta wear a certain type of whatever it is and make sure your outward appearance looks exactly what God would want you to look like. And then he could start working with you. You have to be sinless first before you can come to God. Lies. Wow. Whereas relationship says, come to me. Jesus says, is it not the sick that need the doctor? He's come to heal you from the inside out. Doctors don't care what you look like on the outside. They care about the fact that there's something hurting inside you. They care about the fact that you have something that has yet to be healed. Wow. I gotta be honest with you guys. This entire word, I don't know who needs to hear it, but there has been nothing but distraction trying to stop me from saying what I have to say. I haven't gotten my chairs in time. There's been a bunch of noise outside. My cat has jumped on my Bluetooth keyboard. I don't even know how many times interrupting my iPad from doing what I gotta do over here. This word I believe is for somebody and it's meant for you to receive it. So don't close your ears on it. Religion condemns each other. Whereas the father convicts us via correction of the Holy Spirit. 
Has your father or mother never corrected you? But he's our father. He corrects us for our betterment. And the crazy thing is that a lot of people tend to believe that God will be the one that says, hey, by the way, you're just going to hell, right? Like, I don't actually want you up here. I'm sending you straight to hell. Hmm. Actually, that's the default. Because of our sin, that's the default. That's where we're going. He has given you the free will to make your own choices and to learn from your own mistakes, to take accountability, to actively make the choice to get to know him. Because he's not going to force himself on you. He's a gentleman. He's going to knock and say, hey, by the way, the opportunity is here just in case you want it. I'm here whenever you are. I'm ready whenever you are. But it's up to you to make that choice. I'm gonna tell you guys a quick testimony that occurred a little bit ago while I was at church. Long story short, I was at a fast with my church. I was praying and out of nowhere, I had a little notebook with me because I always tend to bring a notebook with me. Out of nowhere, I felt the Holy Spirit tell me, write this down, write this down. So I wrote it down. And it was the verse from Matthew that says, I desire mercy, not sacrifice. Don't know why. Okay, sure. Look, I have no idea why I'm feeling pushed to write this down, but let's write it down. The Lord put upon my heart to write down Abraham and Isaac's sacrifice. I said, okay, so sacrifice is a common theme here. Great, Lord, thank you. I'm gonna write it down. I have no idea why you're telling me this, but let's do it. Next thing you know, prayer is over, whatever. It's time for us to do like a little part um, in the fast where the church gets together and one person is picked to speak a reflection, right? So they basically share word from the week that they that God has put on their heart to share with everybody. So somebody came up and he began with saying, I don't know what it is, but the Holy Spirit has been putting on my heart. I don't talk to this person, by the way, just another brother in Christ. He goes, I don't know why, but the Lord has been putting in my heart the term of sacrifice. Oh, has he really now? <laughs> You should have seen me in the chair, guys. I was freaking out, freaking out because when the Holy Spirit moves like that, he is consistent. It was so wild to me. Every time the Holy Spirit does this thing where he moves like that, I'm like, whoa, because there's no coincidences in God. You think that there's coincidences in your circumstances? I promise you that there's not. I promise. He says, I've been thinking about the word sacrifice and he's been, the Lord has been bringing to my mind the story of Abraham and Isaac. What are you willing to sacrifice for God? I said, shut up. I was over here squirming in my seat. I was like, that's crazy. And I was just, well, in my head, right? And then I gave the testimony of what, literally what just occurred a couple of minutes ago while I was sitting in that chair and the Holy Spirit just poured and I was just crying and the whole church was like, whoa, what just happened? Because glory to God, God still speaks. But meanwhile, he's asking us, what are we willing to sacrifice for a relationship with him? Because a lot of us don't want to come to God because we just don't want to change the life that we're living. Right? Let's be honest. I don't want to stop partying. I don't want to stop clubbing. I don't want to stop doing the things I got to do. I don't want to stop sleeping with who I want to sleep with. Let's be honest. Because that's exactly how I was. I wanted to be sinless before I came to God. I was mistaken. Because when I came to God and I asked him, I said, God, make me who you want me to be. How do you want me to do this? Because my, myself, I just, I still want to keep living the life that I want to live, Lord. And live with you when I want. Have my own relationship with you. When people would ask me, I'd say, yeah, well, yeah, I have my own relationship with God. One that I made myself, that I cultivated myself, not the one that he actually designed for me to have with him, that he actually wanted to take control of. Because let's be honest, anything I've done in my power has never really worked out for my good. But he came along and said, let me show you what real relationship is. But here's the word that the Lord gave me in that time. He said, absolutely, yes, we need to sacrifice for our relationship with the Lord. But religion, mm, we need to be careful because there are people nowadays that are not aware that they're sacrificing God's will by also sacrificing each other. Shut up. Whoa, glory to God. Wow. I'm telling you, when the Lord speaks, it's crazy. Wow, 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 wow. That verse is from Matthew 9, 13, in case you wanted to check it out. The problem is, is that those things that the Lord is asking you to sacrifice are things that are gonna pull you farther from him. And the farther that you are from him, the worse this is gonna be, this life is gonna be. The less happiness that you'll have, the less light you'll have. And I know, because I went through the, I went through 15 years without him, 15 years. Don't ask me my age. 
So twofold by religion causing us to sacrifice each other, God's children, mm. God's children, brothers and sisters, that's what we are. So by us sacrificing each other, that's one right there, that's one sacrifice. And by us sacrificing his will via, via sacrificing each other and the unity he has called us for, we're double sacrificing things that he does not want us to sacrifice. Instead of sacrificing things that we have internally, we point the finger and try to sacrifice things from others as if it was our thing to give up in the first place. Wow, God, wow. Lord, speak, 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 Lord. Glory to you, Lord. That verse says, I desire mercy, not sacrifice, for I did not come to call the righteous, but sinners. Oh, he didn't call to come to people that thought that they were better than others. He came to call the ones that humbled themselves and said, I don't deserve you because I am a sinner. I have told a white lie. I have stolen. I have hurt people. I have killed. Do you know how much power it takes to be humble? Wow. God, God, God. Jesus is spicy, y'all. I don't care what y'all gonna say. <laughs> oh, wow. <laughs> so Jesus is saying, I didn't come here for those that thought that they were holier than thou and had a VIP pass straight to heaven. <laughs> Which by the way, they don't. Nobody is sinless. We are all sinners. What he has taught us is that none of us are better than each other. And the judgment, the pointing fingers, the division, that the Lord's churches are being built upon. Imagine building a foundation on a divided piece of land. Woo! Wow, Lord. These clicks and the making others feel left out from his love, his mercy, and his grace. That's a no-go in God's eyes. Not only that, can I also say this? Ooh, Lord, I had to, the Lord had me write this down, but this is tough. Wow, Lord, glory to you, Lord. This is something that the Holy Spirit is trying to tell me right now that it's hard for me to say because sometimes people will hear what I'm about to say and they'll think that the person thinks that they're better than everybody and all these other things. I am nobody. I am nothing without him. Nothing, nothing, nothing. I am an empty vessel. But when it comes to the ministry of prophetic word, the gift of prophecy, sometimes we have to speak the things that are really, really hard to speak that nobody wants to hear. The truth was not meant to be pretty all the time, to be soft all the time. His word is described as a double-edged sword. You think that was not gonna hurt to hear the truth? And I know, cause God has had to correct me and call me out quite a few times and it never feels good. And I never feel the need to run back to God after I get in trouble with him. You ever get punished by your parent? You don't just run to them and be like, hey, we're okay now, right? No. You feel shame and you want to run away. And that's what happens though when people hear the truth of his word. And the truth of his word says that we need to love each other, but also that we need to have a relationship with him. A relationship equals consistency, communication, effort, depth, and connection. The Holy Spirit revealed to me that many people in religion today are not only sacrificing God's will and each other, by eliminating relationships between one another. Ooh, ooh, Lord. But they're also attempting to sacrifice each other's ministries. Ooh, God, that's tough. Mm. Wow, 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 okay. There are people in churches getting sacrificed and killed spiritually. They're dying spiritually. They're being attacked with arrows from the pews of the churches, rotting away spiritually. They're dying because lack of word, because of lack of love, because of lack of connection with the Lord and what he's called us to do. They're dying out there. And people, they're, the nation is screaming for God right now, needing God and everything that he has to offer. And there's people on the pews acting as gatekeepers, not allowing to, for God to step through and heal the people of the church because some have made themselves leaders and chief in command and they're sacrificing God's position where he should be, which is front center of the church. I also wanna remind you though, that this isn't happening without cause or a purpose. This is biblical. All of this is biblical. This was actually preached about already in the word. In John 16 verses two to four, it speaks of church hurt and people acting in this way. Let's find the verse, hold on. All right, I found it, I found it. Eee. It says, I have told you these things to keep you from stumbling. They will ban you from synagogues 
In fact, a time is coming when anyone who kills you will think he is offering service to God. They will do these things because they haven't known the Father or me. Wow, wow, wow. Wow. I can't. Every time I... Whew. He warned us that people were going to do this. I just want you to know a little bit about the person that I'm also telling you to be in a relationship with. I believe that God is so misunderstood still to this day. Because not for nothing. So the Jews believed that what they were getting was a Messiah that was like the king of armies, right? Which he is. But Jesus then presents himself in physical form as basically a pacifist, right? He was one of the ones that when the adultering woman who was caught in the act came to, they brought her to him. The Pharisees were yelling at him saying, due to the law that we should stone her. But he was clever. And he said to them, the first of you to be without sin, throw the first stone. Y'all like to throw stones while you're living in a glass house, is what Jesus said. He was a pacifist. He, he wasn't misogynistic like people think he is. You know how many women preach the word in the Bible? And everybody loves to take this one verse out of context where it's talking about the woman in that specific time that were absolutely not examples of the women of the Lord. But there are prophetesses, there are fighters, there are prayer warriors, there are women of God in this book, in the Bible, in the word of God. And not only that, women are actually described with the same characteristics and, and adjectives that are used to describe God as well. He loves all of us, every single one of us. He even actually revealed himself first to women after he resurrected from the cross. Hello? Well, technically he resurrected from the tomb, not getting into details. Anyways, not only that, the Lord used then also his mother, Mary. I know I'm getting off on a tangent here, but it just, it just boggles my mind sometimes. He used his mother, Mary. The Lord used Mary, a woman living in poverty to carry the bloodline of David a king who would then also bring about Jesus, the Messiah, our savior. And I don't say this to lift up women above men. Hello, let's get it together. What I'm saying is the same thing I've been saying is that nobody is above another women or men or children or elderly. Cause yes, every single one of those type of people are mentioned in the word of God. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. He says in his word, old men will have dreams. Young men will see visions and your sons and daughters will prophesy. Everyone is included in this. And you know what's even crazier too? I'm gonna, listen, I'm gonna read this exactly how I wrote it. Jesus even says that he didn't even have to convince God to love you. He already did. John 16, 26 to 27. I did not ask the father on your behalf for he loves you. <laughs> Everything that happened in the Bible symbolically is actually happening a second time now. There, these are cyclical prophecies. They are seen multiple times in the word and now, of course. There's a powerful word that the Lord has given me, that the Holy Spirit has convicted me of and revealed to me that he gave me that will be coming soon. And maybe if the next, it's the next one if God wants it to be. And it's called cancel culture, a seed from the pits of hell. Watch out. Oh gosh, that one is insane. I will say, um, if you even are not a believer now, you're still gonna see some truth in that one because it's really hard not to, amen? I also just wanna leave off with a few more accounts of the fact that he wants a relationship with you. I need you to negate, he needs you to negate religion and what they teach and get to know him first and foremost above everything. Be a follower of Christ, not man-made condemning doctrine. First of all, I need to talk to you really quick. Anybody that's intellectually honest here, do you believe that it was just a funny coincidence that he uses familial and relational terms to describe his relationship with us? Come on. First of all, father, son, relationship. <laughs> he calls us his children, relationship. And what's even better about it is the fact that he didn't mean for us to be alone. Jesus says, I will not leave you as orphans. I will send you the Holy Spirit, which he did. Therefore, we're not alone. We have our counselor, our advocate, but then also he never meant for any of us to be alone on this earth. We're meant to be a part of a congregation, a community. We are brothers and sisters, relationship. Wow, Lord. And it says it in his word too, that's what we are called. It says, in the day of Pentecost in Acts 1 and 2, Peter, who Jesus left in charge on earth to build his church, addresses everyone as brothers and sisters more than once all together is how it's stated this indicates relationship and unity 
I don't need to say it multiple times. And those are just a few that I've seen in the word. Imagine how much more is probably in there. He uses the words father, son, friend, brothers and sisters, and even mothers. Oh my gosh. Matthew 12, 46 to 50. While Jesus was still talking to the crowd, his mother and brothers stood outside, the ones of blood, wanting to speak to him. Someone told him, your mother and brothers are standing outside wanting to speak to you. He replied to them while he was pointing at his disciples. He said, who is my mother and who are my brothers? Here are my mother and my brothers for whoever does the will of my father in heaven is my brother and sister and mother. Come on. Y'all, he wants this closeness with you. You just have to open up and ask for it. He's a gentleman and he will wait for you to give him the green light. And to be honest, in my experience, I wouldn't say wait 15 years because the sooner you do it, the better. I need you to understand that his voice is a voice of encouragement, of peace, of love. He nudges in correction. It's all for edification. He's just amazing. Last verse I'm gonna share with you guys and we're done. Let's read Matthew 11, 28 to 29. All right, y'all, Matthew 11, 28 to 29. Again, if my verses are a little bit off number wise too, I have the NIV version and the verses are all written on the side. <laughs> so sometimes I feel like I get the verses, but they're never perfectly on the number. So I apologize. This is so cute. Come to me, all of you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take up my yoke and learn from me because I am lowly and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. If you don't know what yoke means, yoke is something that they used to put on um, the animals back then. I think it was like more like bulls. Not sure, don't quote me. Um, basically, it was something that they joined two animals at the neck. If I can find a picture, maybe I'll insert it here. So when he says that being yoked to him, your burdens will be light. You will no longer feel that weight. You can find rest and refuge in him. I gotta pray. <laughs> Long story short, when you have a relationship with Jesus, everything in your life will feel lighter. Those burdens that you carried before, the burdens of religion, the burdens of not feeling good enough, the burdens of God doesn't love me, those are all gone in Jesus' name. Wow, that was an amazing word. He's telling you today that a relationship with him is lighter than what you think it might be. These standards that society and churches and other people have put on you are not the same standards he holds you by. He loves you. Accept him in your heart today if you felt this word touched you. Glory to you, Father. I just wanna say thank you so much for the opportunity of being able to read your word and the word that you have placed on my heart for these people today, Lord God. I ask that it be you, Lord God, touching the souls of every single person watching, Lord God. Let it be you giving them an encounter with you, Lord God, that's undeniable and unshakable, Father God. Let them feel your love so they can also create a relationship with you, Lord God, and eliminate any religious mindset. In Jesus' name we pray, amen, amen. Thank you all for spending time with me and I'm gonna see y'all in the next one. Bye.